Hello, uh, welcome to the TFO Football Podcast. Um, we're going to be back with our regular podcast next week, uh, in which Alex, Joe and I are going to be talking about Brighton. Uh, today, though, we're going to return to our journalist series, uh, in, in which we talk to different people with, within the industry about the, their beginnings and their, uh, and their jobs. So today, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Peter Drury. Peter, hello. How are you doing, Seb? I'm very well. Um, okay, so full disclosure for anyone listening. Uh, I did interview uh, Peter about a year and a half ago. About a year and a half ago? Something like that, yeah. For, for a print article. Um, so if he develops a sort of a glazed over look in his eyes, it's because <laughs> I'm asking him the, the same question. So that's entirely my fault. Um, and also, I should say that we, we, we did try and do this two months ago, but... Um, GWR sabotaged our plans and yeah. left me on a train for six hours. By the way, if you, if you work for GWR, I, I don't know how you sleep at night, I'll be honest. I, you're a, a, <laughs> an absolute disgrace. Uh, Peter, um, so talk me through the, sort of the beginnings of the career. I know you started, uh, you started by, by sort of aiming towards broad sports journalism. Yes, I um, graduated from university and um, after a month as an accountant, which was never going to work out. <laughs> I started doing what I think, in a much more modern sense, 21 year olds do now, just firing off letters. Yeah. Uh, and I fired off an awful lot of letters to an awful lot of local newspapers, local radio stations, um, so on and so forth. I had a great pile of rejections. And eventually I got given a chance by a guy who I didn't appreciate it at the time, but was one of the great legends of Fleet Street. Sports journalism, a chap called Reg Hater, who ran the agency yeah. in London at the time. Um, he judged me only on my handshake, again, in a very old fashioned way. That's old school. Yeah, yeah, very, very old school, yeah. <laughs> and I know that because um, one time when he was out for a liquid lunch, you know, I saw his notes on me, uh, which I shouldn't good have handshake. seen. And it said exactly that <laughs> good, good handshake, he'll do well. And really, that was his assessment of me, which is extraordinary, really because uh, I think I've got a fairly ordinary handshake. Um, but uh, anyway, that, I, I had a couple of years with haters, uh, which, um, which gave me great experience in print journalism uh, and a little bit of broadcast journalism, not a lot. Uh, and I started to get bylines with national newspapers and, and that sort of thing, and, and things were going in the right direction. But um, I suppose I had always, deep down, lent towards broadcasting. And uh, I applied for and got a job with BBC Local Radio in Leeds at the start of the 1990s. Uh, so I was with Radio Leeds at a very fortunate time when Leeds United were the champions, which was great for my profile within the BBC then. You know, if you're at the local radio station that has the story, they're constantly at the network wanting your interviews and your work and clips of action and all of that sort of thing. Uh, so that worked out very kindly for me. Uh, had happy days covering Huddersfield Town and Bradford City when in the third division and Halifax Town, Yorkshire cricket. As a soft southerner, I learned a little bit about rugby league, um, only a little bit. Um, and those were great years. And, and they coincided again very fortuitously for me. Uh, they dovetailed with the start of what we now know as Five Live. Uh, and so I got an opportunity at Broadcasting House London. It's not where it is now. Of course, it's up in Salford now. but um as as that aspect of um bbc radio was burgeoning um and at the same time as sky was coming into being sky and bsb two separate things then uh and so job opportunities were suddenly occurring in in, in sports broadcasting and i was one of several um who benefited at that time how does how does it work? I mean, because obviously, um, I think the first time I, I was aware of you uh, was when you came onto ITV's Champions League co coverage in the nineties. How does it work? So if you're if you're um, if you're working on a local radio station, is it sort of it, does it work in the same way that normal football does? And it kind of oh, this this jury guy is doing well in the kind of the the reserves and the under twenty ones. Let's give him a let's give him well, a go. In the... I I think back then it certainly did. Yeah. I, I don't know now. Um, but back then, within the BBC, there was a, a sort of competitive progression. And uh, if you're fortunate enough to be at one of the sort of big city stations and they liked the sound of you, they kept tabs on you. Yes, actually, you felt sort of scouted. Yeah. And, and there was a bit of a, how, a halfway house, a thing they called the local radio desk in the network centre, which was responsible for gathering and providing for local radio stations the whole national and international sports news. And uh, I had a spell on that, 
which which sort of familiarizes you um with with the sort of higher echelons if if yeah for want of a better way of putting it um so yeah it, it kind of was like that uh and and there there, there was then i th- i think possibly things were ch- there was a great um i have to be careful what i say here but sort of clubbiness about the bbc yeah which which those and i now understand it because i was part of it outside of it uh sometimes resented i think you know because again then unlike now really the bbc was the only place if you're going to progress towards somewhere near the very top you had to be now there are commercial alternatives yeah you know so it's not quite the same as it was and what's more the bbc since then has taken much more seriously and quite rightly good young prospects from outside of it's itself. It's not a it's not a closed club. Not anymore. a closed club no, anymore. No, no. And I, ex- that's exactly it. And but but at, at that time, I was fortunate to get my foot in the door at the BBC because there was no better place to get yeah. a foot in the door. So you how how does how does the the switch to ITV um, come about though? I mean, I I know obviously uh, this is sort of this is about ninety. 96. A little bit after that, ninety-seven, eight. So Brian yeah. Moore is is coming uh, yeah. to the end of his career. Um, yeah. Was there? Did they they get in contact with you and sort of? Kind of, yes. I mean, it, you know, um, <laughs> it it was really working for me at the BBC, um, and I loved it. I loved it. I cried the day I left the BBC. Really? I really did. I loved the BBC. I still do love the BBC. Uh, I um, was working on great matches. Um, and at the start of the 97, 98 season, I began to get given chances on match of the day. And those, those, I, and I mean, you know, single figure chances, uh, but those were in the days where it was Motson Davis, bit of, bit of Tony Gubber or John Chapman, but basically not yeah. all 10 games were done. They used to do that really quick round. round they, up. They'd like have three or four, yeah. like sort of 10 minutes. And yes. then they'd, they'd rattle through the goals from the rest of from the fixtures. From the rest, exactly. Okay. And, you know, when I got the third match, yeah. On match of the day. That yeah. then was, I'm not saying it's not now, but then it was kind of a wow moment for me. Um, Sheffield Wednesday Everton at Hillsborough where I, I, uh, was, was my debut on match of the day, which would have been somewhere, I suppose, September, October 1997. Did you know when you, were, when you went up to Hillsborough that day that it was, I mean, presumably it works in the way that it does now and that um, match of the day schedules, depending on what actually happens in the game. Yes. So did you know you were going to be taking that third slot? Um, well, it was very obviously the third best game. Okay. But, but yeah, just as now, if it had finished 6 all, uh, I guess it would have led the show. It, it, I mean, it didn't. Take that, Motson. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I, I was in awe of the whole situation. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was terrified of it, which is odd, really, because I'd done a lot of live radio, and Match of the Day isn't live, you know, actually. And I, again, I'm not talking it down. You can afford to make a mistake when you're commentating for Match of the Day because it can be repaired. Um, and, yeah. But... It wasn't so much that I was trying to make a mistake in front of the viewing audience. It was a, like all of us, I was working for a boss and I wanted him. It was your opportunity. Was, yeah, it was my opportunity uh... and I had to. And, I, and I, I've, I suppose I must have watched Match of the Day that night, but I've never watched it back, actually, that game. Have you never? Si- not since, because I'm frightened. I probably sounded like a frightened rabbit. Yeah. Talk to me about, I mean, you, you talk about sort of, um, you, you'd obviously done a lot of live work before. Is that a moment where you're, you're sat in the gantry and you got your, you're probably not back then, but now you've got your co-commentator um, next to you and you're thinking, do you ever catch yourself thinking about just how many people are going to be tuning in to, to listen to you? I mean, when I, when I write an article, if I make a mistake, someone weeds it out or, yes. or in, in any way, no one, no, one, no one reads it anyway. Well, yeah. sort of 2,000 people maybe at best. Whereas you've got to kind of, I'm not trying to get into your head the next no. time you do. No, no. Well, I think it's best to edit that out, yeah. to be honest, uh, of your thought process. Because if you did think about everybody individually, um, it, it possibly would terrify you. Uh, and, and I think, I don't think I thought this when I was younger, but I do now. I think a mistake is inevitable. Yeah. And as you say, if you're typing a written piece, um, you have the chance to go back over it and put it right. And if you're broadcasting it live, you don't have that chance. And so instead of beating yourself up for it, I now realize you have to be phlegmatic and understand that that is going to, if you, if anybody talks, I remember I've said this to a couple of sort of famous footballers who've tried their hand at co-commentary. If anybody talks unscripted for two hours, 
they're going to say something silly, yeah. you know, or get something wrong. And, and that's a, that is a matter of fact. Yeah. And uh, let me tell you, Seb, every single match, perhaps with, you know, 1% exception rate, broadly, every single match I commentate on contains a mistake. At least one mistake, probably four or five. I think, um, I think one of the, the things that, uh, that stayed with me, look, the, the, the first time we, we sat down and, and, and did an interview, you were telling me about, um, you, you were commentating on the 2014 World Cup final, and you were sat in the country, which was a long way away from where Mario Goetze scored the winning goal. And you said, oh, well, I, I saw it happen, and I, I just shouted Goetze. And then you, I think you said in, in a sort of the few seconds after, you thought, well, actually, I hope that was actually Mario Goetze yeah. who scored that. It never really occurred to me. It's like, you, it just... Have you ever, um, what do you do when something, I mean, I, I accept completely that if you talk for 90 minutes, mistakes going to happen, sort of, you know, twist words and, and mangle sentences, I understand. But how do you cope with potentially making a mistake? Or, 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 or how do you condition yourself to not worry about making that kind of mistake? Well, it's, it's, it's a really odd one, that, and it's a very difficult one to answer because in the end, this is instinctive. Yeah. Something told me to shout Goethe. Yeah. Now, I might have just got a flash of his number or the color of his boots or something like that. And you have to rely on that. I mean, at a, a much humbler level, funnily enough, this weekend just gone as we speak, I commentated on Watford Crystal Palace and Andre Gray scored a winning goal for Watford. And Pereira played a lovely ball into him. And I went, Gray. And there was a moment where I thought, oh, blimey, that's not Deeney, is it? You know, uh, because in that moment, it just might have been. It's so quick. And it's so quick, yeah. yeah. And, and so far, broadly speaking, the wiring of my mind has enabled me to get those on the whole right. What, what actually worries me now I'm older, and I'm not talking about senility or whatever, although <laughs> that, that will come as well. That's a broader concern. Yeah, That's a, a more concern. general issue. Yeah. But, but one day, the wiring won't work. Uh, one day... Um, in a moment like that, and that's that. Even now, at the age of fifty-one, that's when I think about. Do you know what? Shall I pack it in before that happens? Judging that moment when, when, when the wiring makes you panic in the moment, yeah, or just gets it wrong, because um, it could happen. And and listen, I've got plenty of goals wrong. I mean, you know, uh, you hope not to very often, but. You get a goal wrong and you have to hope it happens in a game that you can deal with getting a goal wrong in. But if it's a World Cup final or, a, you know, that, that would be a bad one. If it's Aguero's goal, you, you know, and you shouted Nasri, that would be a horrible, horrible moment. But, but it could happen. And yeah. that, that's, that's the kind of extra edge of a, of a monstrously big game. I suppose also like the Aguero thing, um, obviously it's one of Martin Tyler's uh, yeah. most famous moments. You just think like, okay, so... It's famous for its kind of rising inflection there. Yeah. What if he, he initially stumbles over yeah. his identification? Exactly. I comment, I, I, we, we interviewed Jonathan Northcroft um, a couple of months ago um, around the release of his, his World Cup diary. And he said um, something which is completely true in that in, in a, when you're in a stadium, when you're reporting or commentating, your reference points within the game, because it moves so quickly, are very few. So when, when journalists are marking players out of 10, they might see two or three touches yeah. or they might remember it. And you think this is just like it, it? It's so quick; it must be a nightmare. Um, let's let's circle back a little bit because I we we've got a little bit ahead of ourselves. I've got overexcited. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, we're talking about replacing Brian Moore. Mm. Um, to me, when I was I grew up in a house without Sky, so when I heard Brian Moore's voice, uh, it was big game time. Mm. When you heard him speak, it's this is important. He had that. I I, I you can't teach really what he had. He had this amazing gravitas yes, to him. Yes, he did, yeah. Is that, was, that, was that a difficult thing? Well, cause... first of all, I have to say, Seb, and this is not false modesty, I didn't replace Brian Moore. Clive Tilsley did. Okay. And I stepped in behind Alongside there. Alongside Clive. So I was not the voice. You know, I never did a Champions League final for ITV. Okay. Um, so I didn't, I didn't have that to do, uh, per se, which does not detract at all, in my mind, from the honour of filling in behind Brian Moore. In the space that he In the occupies. space that he, okay. he left, um, because he was a very, very kind man. And it, it was, for, for me, it's more personal, really, because he was so very encouraging to me in my early weeks and months with ITV, leading up to his retirement, and then actually in the months after. And, and those were still very, sort of, if you like, formative years or months for me in my television life. 
and to have his blessing, especially when I was thinking, people were telling me, you were better at radio, you know, you were better at radio. And I, at that stage, I certainly was, because I'd done it for several years and I hadn't done television for very many. And I was feeling insecure. I, I could turn to letters that Brian Moore had written me, telling me, actually, don't you worry about that, you're fine. And that meant a great deal because yeah. he had cracked it. I think that's kind of a mark of a person, actually, that he did that. Because obviously, in that situation, if you're a little bit of an institution, which he most certainly was, then you want to wish your successor well. But in a lot of cases, not just in football commentary, but in general life, you get, you get people that kind of only sort of half wish them well. Yes, yeah. Quite like that people still pine after them in a way. And that's, uh, that's a yes. lovely story. When, when you were... Um, you talked about kind of um, your early enthusiasm for broadcasting. Did you do you have um, did you have influences when you were when when you were? Well, my my favourite commentator was on the radio, Peter Jones, okay. who was who was a beautiful, authoritative voice uh, and a, a poetic voice, a beautiful Welsh lilt, uh, who was the BBC's voice of all great occasions, not all, uh, not not just sport. Actually, he did royal occasions and, and things like that. Um, Royal Tournament, I remember him doing once. Very possibly, yeah. 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 Uh, and who had uh, a turn of phrase which was phenomenal. I mean, he was, he was just a beautiful broadcaster. And I, I was the classic uh, sort of 1970s, 80s football anorak of the sort that didn't go to football. I didn't have parents who took me to football, but I would lock my bedroom door on a Saturday afternoon and have Sport on 2 on and uh, listen to him when they did just second half commentary of the main game. And it was, he, he, he was the soundtrack that uh, I loved. When you, when you, well, because you started in radio, I mean, I, I, from the outside, I see them as very different disciplines because, I, oh, is it not, I mean, I, I, okay, forgive me if I, I get this wrong. If, as a radio commentator, presumably the, um, the onus is on you to fill a lot more airtime. Yes. With a lot more description because obviously, so how do, you, how do you go from radio to television and how do you sort of naturally rational, rational, ration well, even yourself? Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. very, very difficult. And actually I have a, a respect for the guys who do a bit of both still now. Um, I have to say, and, and I mean no disrespect when I say this, I think it is almost impossibly, almost impossible to do them both really really well because they do each interfere with the other uh, and and that is not to knock those who are yeah. doing that because that's what they're asked to do so get on with it and they, and they do it very well but but yes radio uh, self-evidently it has to be seamless you are the picture um and so, so that gives you a much broader canvas and that is why actually in my early television years people were right when they said you're more suited to radio because i'm a great lover of words yeah, uh, and radio lends itself to words because you're painting the whole picture, um, and so there is that about radio. There is also, I have to say, and I, I say this from the position of someone who's now predominantly a television commentator. There's a there's a much greater um, relaxation around radio. There's a much there's much less need for absolute accuracy. So big, again, self evidently, because the listener can't see what you're getting wrong and can't see what you're failing to mention. What you say is, is the truth, regardless of whether it's the truth or not. So if on the far side of the field someone's in possession of the ball, it's my job as a television commentator simply to say his name. Uh, if I'm a radio commentator and someone's on the far side of the field, I think, oh, damned if I know who that is, you can start talking about the setting sun or yeah, the, the yeah. moon over the stand on the far side or the smell of the hot dogs. <laughs> You know, all of those things which can buy you time or or you can just turn to your sidekick and say, um, talk about the manager. Because on the television, you talk about the manager when the director gives you a close-up of the manager. So you've got to be switched on enough to have something to say about him when he becomes you, the, the, the chief job of, not job, but, but the discipline of television is, as they say, to talk to the picture. Yeah. So if you find yourself, I mean, it, it, invariably it does happen. You, you can't be absolutely precise. But if you find yourself wittering on about the coach when the picture is of the left wing just taking on the fullback, you know, the, the words aren't marrying with the action that the viewer is seeing. And that is irritating and sort of discombobulating. Yeah. Um, on the radio, you talk about what you choose to talk about. And as long as you're more or less there when the ball enters the net, 
uh, that's kind of okay. You, you know what was what was really interesting? Do you remember a long time ago um, when Sky were kind of rolling out their their new features, their red button bits, and alongside their the different camera angles, they had like a they had fans there commentating yeah. side by side. What was really interesting to me was that a lot of them did exactly what you've just talked about. Like they they didn't they weren't there to sort of mug each other off and you know prod each other through ninety minutes. They tried to commentate, mm. and it was excruciating mm. because it was kind of. It showed sort of what a what a professional discipline it is, because when when you had guys that were kind of trying to do their very best Martin Tyler, mm. for instance, it was just like it, it was it was unbearable. I I I cringe out a kidney. Yes. It. it was just yes. it was, it was terrible. Um, I suppose also um, tell me how long have you been with Jim Beglin as a co-commentator? Well, Jim, oh gosh, um, well oddly enough, some of his early games with Five Live, uh, I did, so. I first worked with him, <laughs> excuse me, probably 1995, I would think. Wow. Something like that, yeah. Which doesn't mean that we have worked only together no, since no, 1995, sure, sure. but uh, <laughs> it would be around about then. What's the, um, I mean, I, people understand the, the role of the co-commentator um, in a knowledge sense. I mean, mm. he's there to add colour to what you do. In, in terms of the actual, the chemistry of the partnership, what is, what is the... What is the function there? What are, what are Jim's best attributes, I well, suppose, is what I'm asking. I mean, I would say this, so you can, you can have as many pinches of salt as you like, uh, but I think he is outstanding. Yeah, me too. Uh, because uh, he is very professional in his approach to work. I'm not going to name any names or make any insinuations. You, you, honestly, this is... This An is, excellent disclaimer, Peter. The, the, very, very the, nice here comes a disclaimer. <laughs> but there are those who turn up and just expect to talk. Yeah, I think people would yes. uh, agree yeah. with that. Yeah, and he absolutely doesn't. He he ensures that he has watched the last game, or if possible, two of the teams he's going to watch. He's going to commentate on. He has made notes. He's made not notes in the sense that I do statistical and factual notes, but he has written down observations he might like to make about players and teams. Um, he is properly prepared, and. One of the many reasons I like working with him is because I think we both understand um, what our role is. And my role is essentially a factual role. My role is who's got the ball, um, what they have done in their career, where they are on the field, and his role is why and how. And I have always held the opinion that it is not the job of the commentator, me, to have an opinion. My opinion is no more important than anybody else's. The point of the co-commentator, particularly on television, is to have a professional, balanced opinion based on the fact that, he, in his case, he has played the game to a very, very high level. He understands the mechanics through which the players are going, uh, and he is able to make a judgment and share it. Now, you don't have to share his opinion, but you do have to acknowledge that it is a very educated opinion um, and an opinion um, born out of experience. And listen, I don't say we don't occasionally um, wander into each other's territory because I suppose every time I say, oh, that's a lovely pass, that's an opinion that it's a lovely pass. And, and equally, he might say to me, God, that's six and seven for him, isn't it? And so he's sort of on my side of the fence. But broadly speaking, um, we both know where we are. Uh, and for me, it works. It's, yeah. Is it a little bit like a safety net? So if, um, if for instance, uh, he's off camera, but Joe is sitting next to me now. Um, Joe and I are, are, are talking our way through a football game. And one of us just starts monologuing in that kind of, in those sort of that sentence structure, which you can't really escape from. Is it is part of the role to be for, for your co-commentator just to sort of to, to pull you back from the edge of the cliff and, and kind of yeah. to balance? Yeah, absolutely right. And and that does happen. I mean, that does happen. Um hopefully not too wildly and hopefully not in a way that um is often noticeable. But uh yeah, you you he might say something that makes me think, do you know what I, I I might be misjudging this game. I might be misreading this game. Um, and so I might go, not absolutely silent, but, you know, quiet for a minute or two 
and haul back and think, do you know what? We'll 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 have a reboot here. Have, have a bit of a, yeah, have we'll a cup of tea. Yeah, or, yeah exactly. <laughs> we'll just kind of reboot the whole the whole shebang and go again. You know, if if I get into one of those, we've got, Jim. This is the greatest game there has ever been. And Beglin's and, sh- and, elbowing and, you. Yeah, in the, in the... Saying, oh, it's quite good, Peter. It's, it's all right. You know, it's all right. <laughs> Settle down. Settled down. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So yeah, no, he's a great he's a great thing. And the other great thing about him, if I may say so, and and I hope it's for, you know. Sorry if this is immodest, but I, I reflect as well, is that I think we both realise that nobody tunes in for us. And I say this repeat, it is not about me commentating or him co-commentating. Everybody, bar perhaps a relation, uh, tunes in uh, to watch the football match. That is the reason for the broadcast, and we are not. And um, he is one of those people who does not want to be well-known, Uh, And in a way, his career reflects that nicely because of a great Liverpool team that won the double in 1986. He is probably the least famous. Probably Uh, remembered really for for the circumstances which brought that to an end. Absolutely. Unfortunately for him. Absolutely. You ask anybody about him from that era and they will tell you he was a really first class player with a wand of a left foot and uh, just an outstanding full back. but because his career ended so yeah, early, abruptly. he never became super famous. And that suits his style as a broadcaster, actually. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, because I, I knew Jim Beglin, the voice, before I knew Jim Beglin, the player. Yeah. Um, and that's, well, I, I, I kind of, I, I, I got used to, to, to almost in that situation, the authority comes from the playing reputation, whereas in his case, it's the other way around. I suppose that's very flattering for, for him. That's, that's indicative of the, the job he does. Um, you talked about how uh, your job is to be impartial. Your job yes. is not to... A long time ago, I, ITV did a, um, a, a feature. That, I think it was called something like uh, the 50 best Champions League goals. Yeah. And you were on there and you were talking about how for a while, Kaká was one of your favourite players. Yeah. How do you... I, how, how, does, how does that work into the... Um, how do you develop those affections as a commentator, given that your, your perspective is supposed to be so broad? And I suppose also... Are there any, any other players that you particularly enjoy commentating on well, for whatever I, reason? I think having a favourite player, certainly in that con- certainly in the Champions League context, where we're talking about stellar clubs which aren't even our own, it's quite safe to have a favourite player. It's probably safer to have a Milan player as your favourite player. Peter, nothing's safe anymore. No, it's, it's not, is it? <laughs> no, it's, it's not, just not. It? No, no. But um, regardless of that, uh, I, unlike the issue around club identities, I think it's, I think, I mean, people might not like it. Um, I think it's okay to have a favourite player. I really do. And at that time, it was Kaká. And it's the enthusiasm, if you like, of a neutral fan, just to say what a thrill it is to watch this bloke play. And, it, you know, the same applied for Zidane. You know, watching, being in the stadium and watching Zidane glide was a really beautiful thing a really beautiful thing and it's the same now with Messi and I know you know you would get into a Messi conversation and I'm you know people think you're you're yeah you think you're becoming cliche but only last week I saw Messi score a couple of goals in the new camp uh one was a ridiculous penalty and the other he sat two international centre-halves down on their backsides and then scored with his wrong foot Albeit the goalkeeper should have saved it, but that doesn't doesn't. But the run the run up to that moment, was, the, yeah, the Leon game, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Leon game. He was yeah. absolutely beautiful, um, and and um, funnily enough, I mean, while we're on that, it, it, you you can't help but identify your favourite players in the early stages of a game and say, here we go, you know, this is a messy game, and um, I, we've covered this before, we've spoken, but in in the Champions League game for which I acquired a certain amount of notoriety last year, the Roma-Barcelona <laughs> game, which, which went sort of berserk at the end. It's um, going to come up what, in our questions well, at the end. <laughs> what, <laughs> one, of the, um, one of the very few disappointments of that night was that Messi played so poorly. Yeah. And there were, there were people in that stadium that night, of course the majority were Roma fans who were thrilled about this extraordinary turnaround, but um, who had come to see Messi. And when it, it's a really difficult thing when the guy around whom you've built the narrative turns out not to be the one around whom the narrative actually plays out. 
I, I remember doing a World Cup in 2002, doing a Portugal game, and having to admit sort of two-thirds of the way in that Luis Figo was essentially having a stinker. You know, having said, hey, here we go, this is yeah, Figo. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it didn't work out. And it, it sort of makes a nonsense of all of your pre-match planning. But I, I, to answer your question, sorry, I've been very long-winded no. about it. I don't have a problem with having a favourite player. No, no. no. You, you, you talked about Roma and Barcelona. We're going to get to that. Um, more recently, um, you did uh, you did BT's coverage for Real Madrid Ajax. Yes. In a Um I remember watching that and thinking, um, how do you, as a commentator, you, you're, you're sat there at what is a pretty seismic event. You know, forgetting just the 90 minutes of football and, and the consequences that are going to come to some of the people involved in it, Solari, mm. of, of, yes. of course. How do, you, um, how do you prevent yourself from, you're a football fan and you're a football lover. So how do you prevent yourself in that situation from drifting into a kind of what on earth is going on here kind of mood, kind of, kind of a good tone, I suppose. Yeah. Does that well, make sense? I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I do stop myself from drifting into that. Term. But it's still coherent, Peter. I remember because I, I, I was watching it and listening to you and thinking, well, he's done a good job there because I, I, I think if I was in his position, I'd just be like, I admire Axe. I think there's a lot of good players yeah. in that team. They're, they're very nice to watch. But that's still an Ajax team that I saw um, uh, concede six goals to Feyenoord a couple of months ago. Yeah. So it's a, it's a kind yeah. of, it's a, almost like a parallel universe type of situation. Is that a, yeah. I suppose it, it, that applies equally to Roma and Barcelona. That was just a... Yeah, or the, uh, yes, it, it, I suppose. And I don't want to sound all earnest about it here because it makes it sound as though... Earnest away, earnest away. <laughs> no, well, yeah. no, yeah. but it's, it sounds overly analytical about something which is actually just instinctive. But... Uh, you began this whole conversation saying it's a series of discussions with journalists. Yeah. And that, that's a kind of journalistic moment when something happens where you've got to identify what the story is. And for, for Real Madrid Ajax, the story was twofold. One, that we had this suddenly emerging, beautiful young Ajax team, which in a way it would be preferable to concentrate on because that's the positive side of the story. But you couldn't hide from the fact that here with a lot that had won the thing three times running capitulating um and and apart from being a football fan i think we have this in common i i i have um perhaps too close and emotional a relationship with the humanity of it all uh which is one of many reasons i couldn't have been a competitive sportsman because i feel so sorry for the people who are ripped up by football and spat out that uh that mill keeper at the weekend exactly oh. all i could do is weep for him i said to my wife when i got home on sunday um oh. You know, imagine being his mum. Imagine being his mum. Peter, you know, did you see? Did you see the, his 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 tweet? And I, I know you're not on social media, but his kind of on Monday morning he went on social media. So, um, just for the sake of people listening, uh, Joe is asking from off camera. So, um, uh, Mill uh, lost their two goal lead against Brighton in the FA Cup on Sunday, and um, first goal was nobody's fault. Um, but the equaliser, which was in I think the 93rd minute, was yes, I think. just a drifted free kick. 95th minute. Yeah. Drifted free kick going wide. Goalkeeper goes up to claim it. Seems to change his mind and think it's going wide. Then stick his hand up and, and, and he kind of knocks it into his own net. It is it's excruciating to watch. And I'm not a, um, you know, I'll have a good giggle at a defensive mistake with the rest of the, with everybody else. But that was just, it's the humanity of it, it right? It is the yeah. humanity. And th these are, you know, we're, we're off at a tangent here, but we, we, these are all human beings. However much they're paid, whatever, they still have to close the bedroom door and it's dark and think about where they're at. And uh, amid that Ajax Real Madrid story, that fellow Solari, who was obviously a very, very good player because he played for Real Madrid. He wasn't one of their superstars, but he was a good footballer. He'd be wealthy enough. He got the dream job sort of by mistake to be coach of Real Madrid. And here he is as the one who's overseeing this desperate capitulation against the team that everybody knew they were going to beat. It was a given. Ajax was the easy draw. And uh, just in that moment of utter hopelessness and helplessness, you, you can't help but think, poor guy. But I know, I do know, um, that there are people out there who differ with me on that and say, come on, sorry, it's a hard world. You know, Real Madrid are underperforming and you should be saying that. Whereas my position is, do you know what, these guys, for whatever reason, it ain't happening today and I'm feeling sorry for them. But there you are. And the truth probably lies somewhere in between. This, <laughs> this is going to... Um, we'll, we'll go on to Roma-Barcelona, actually. I, um, 
obviously uh that was what's it like to have that attached to you the kind of i mean you were a you said earlier that the commentator no no one watches uh football for the commentary but I, I think in that case people may have not tuned in to see you or hear you but people took something from the work you did on that what's that like to to kind of to become part of the game but also part of an event like that and the, the reaction it spawned was amazing it it was amazing yeah and i've said to you before seb it, it makes me uncomfortable yeah Actually, it does make me uncomfortable for for two for for a couple of reasons one uh, professional reason is that when you get d- despite the fact i try to resist it all i couldn't resist that because it was a you know sort of tsunami of reaction um and it affects my mindset you know going into the next game and all subsequent games thinking well that appears to have been something that people appreciated and it sort of set a bar uh and it's as if every pretty good moment has to match that moment and of course it can't possibly uh and um funny enough my eldest son who is, who is very social media literate um he said to me afterwards he said dad you really wouldn't know what's out there and and i said because i instinctively do i said oh my god no you know i've been but he said to me he said you it's extraordinary i've never seen this so positive about a commentator uh but he said you make sure because social media turns in a day you know what one day is brilliant the next day somebody says do you know what it wasn't that brilliant and then it goes the other way um he said whatever you do we want no more moments like that for the foreseeable future because you won't be loved for it if you do it again is it is it hard having um having children who are of that age your son is is presumably a a football fan too yeah yeah yeah. yeah. um is it difficult when 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 you have that reaction around you to i don't know i just can't relate to it no well on the whole it's been fine i mean my 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 youngest son is about to be 18 so i'm gonna have three adults um and uh it hasn't really been an issue I mean, I, I feel uncomfortable when the youngest one, when he was sort of 12, 13, says, uh, Dad, we were all looking at your Wikipedia page today and all that sort of thing. <laughs> and, I, and I wish I didn't have a Wikipedia page because... God, I'd love to have a Wikipedia well, page. Well, no, you wouldn't. See, if someone else out there wants to write pe- one for me, that'd be terrific. Well, <laughs> people write tosh on it, you know, and it's, it's nonsense oh, a lot but- of the time and all of that. And I, I hate it. And I, I, ju- I just want to curl up. But, but that's me. And actually, he was quite proud of the fact that his friends are looking at my wikipedia page and so you know i i i i really am repelled by all of that yeah but um they seem to have got through school with it and that's all right and i must admit once in a while i say to my eldest you know after a game i said twitter all right tonight and he said dad i don't know who you think you are they're not interested in you you know you there's no mention uh fine that's what i want to hear I'm, i'm at my happiest when there's no mention and, and I've given up even asking now because he's that disdainful. I think, you know what, the only, the only criticisms I really see of commentators now are the silly, the, the bias nonsense that, yes. that, that they tagged Martin Tyler with a couple of years ago. And there's always someone that gets their nose bent yes. out of uh, shape by it. By well, reaction. Martin got into trouble, I think. For a Martial goal, uh, uh, Old, for, Old Trafford. Well, he, sc- he scored a goal, was it Martial, where basically his commentary line ended, yes! It was when yeah, he cut I, through the, it was his debut, he cuts yeah, in, in from the edge yeah. of the box. And then arcs that shot in the, yeah. in the far corner against Liverpool. Yeah, and does he say yes? I he does because yeah. it, it looks because like it's he, that, that's yeah. my point. It's I'm natural. speaking in defence of it. Yeah, he absolutely. is saying yes. Yeah. What a goal! Yeah, but of course the supposition out there is that yes, because I support Man United. Because football fans, when their team scores, go yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That Martin's yes wasn't that at all, and uh, anybody who knows him or knows anything about him knows that there's no way. No way was that an expression of any sort of bias. It was an expression of joy at a great football moment. Martin Tyler, I, I, um, I, I wouldn't say I know Martin. I met him a couple of times and he, um, he's just a guy that really loves the game. Yes. I mean, he, he, um, I remember the first time I met him, he, I mean, he has no reason to, he's a busy guy on match day. Of course he is. He has no reason to, to pay attention to someone like me that says, oh, I, you know, I love your commentary. Yeah. Um, but he, he just, and I've heard this story many times before from other people too, and that just, he'll sit and talk football with you. Yes. Um, 
I remember having a, like a half an hour long conversation with him about Marcus Rashford in Poland once, like for the under 21 championship 2017. It's just like, you've got a game to go and, and he'll just talk with anyone. Yeah. Like, um, it's, uh, yeah, the, the bar thing is just nonsense. It is nonsense. Absolutely nonsense. And he, he, he is engaged with the game like nobody else I know. Does I he, mean, he coaches still, doesn't he? he? Well, he coaches at Woking. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, he loves the game from top to tail. He has a lot of strong opinions about the game. Um, which it wouldn't be for me to express here, but he, 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 football, cliche alert, and football Go is, ahead. <laughs> football is his life. Yeah. Uh, and he's, he has given his life to it like no other broadcaster, I'm sure. So you're not on social media. No. Nope. <laughs> Definitive. <laughs> Others are. Mm. Uh, I think Clive Tilsley is. Most of them are, I think. I think, yeah. yes. Yeah. Derek Ray is. Yeah. Definitely. Derek's very active. Have you ever, you've never been tempted? No, for, the, for a couple of reasons. Um, but the, the chief professional reason is, the one we've sort of already discussed, it gets in my head. It would get in my head. I know what I'm like. Um, and if I am covered in praise, that worries me about how it will affect me going into the next game because I'll try and do the next game like I did the last game. And that might not be the right way of doing it. And I also know that if I'm covered in vitriol, it really will get inside me because I don't have a thick skin. I, I'm absolutely able to take constructive criticism from those whose job it is to constructively criticise me. But I, I really struggle with, with random criticism, if you like. And even, even amid the Roma-Barcelona thing, when I, somebody sent me screenshots of, you know, a hundred lovely comments... But within those, there are three negative ones. And they're the ones that my mind remembers. And maybe that's something screwed up in me. Uh, but I, I just... Um, I don't think that's anything screwed yeah. up with you. I, I, I had a, a thing about six months ago. And I, I've got a very small, modest social media following. But I remember I, I gave out an opinion about Adam Ola Luckman. And I, I was being a, a bit facetious. Yeah. And I've got this torrent of Everton fans who, you know, abuse me. Yeah, that stuff doesn't really bother me, but I, I remember I got home and um, she, you can't see her on camera, but my fiance is sitting, uh, sitting at the back of the studio. Really upset her. Yes. And I remember thinking, that's what gets to me. Yeah. Like, and if you were on social media, you'd have 10 times the following that someone like I do. You'd have, you'd have sort of half a million people at you if, at yeah. any invitation. It's, uh, I don't think it's silly. The, 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 the negative comment is the one that digs into you, yeah. I think. It's, the, it's a horrible thing. It really thing. is. And I, I still remember now, one of my children, when they were younger, seeing in a newspaper, it was before social media had really taken over, seeing a, a newspaper critic's uh, line which said something like, Peter Drury, is there a game he doesn't spoil? Wow. And, you know, when my 10-year-old saw that, he said, Dad, look, you know, that's horrible. How do you deal makes, with that? Uh, well, would you, would you uh, well say to in, a child in, in, that? in his company, I laughed and said, oh, forget it, son. But of course, I didn't forget it. No. Because uh, I've just told you about it, <laughs> you know. It's and and so um, it, it hurts because, um, in, in a way, it's the same things we say about the footballers. I'm only a bloke who's trying his best, and I don't say you have to like what I'm doing. You you don't, and of course, not everyone will. That's the nature of the game. But I sort of think, even if you don't like that, I don't deserve that because I'm trying. I'm trying. You know, if I had been setting out to spoil the game. Um, well, okay, but, but fairly obviously I don't know not. a commentator that does that. But, <laughs> no, exactly. yeah. but it's, it's kind of um, inhumane. It's, it is man's inhumanity to man. It's, uh, there you are. a horrible thing to it's write. It's horrible, yeah, yeah. Let's go on to more positive things. Yeah. Um, so we, we put out on our community page, uh, we, we, told, uh, we told them you, you were coming in and um, got a lot of questions about Pro Evolution Soccer. Yes. Um, and tell us how, how that, uh, there are certain parts of this that you, you can't talk about, um, but tell us how you got involved there, because it's a very popular computer game. And, uh, it is. It is. No, I, I mean... Is it, in my house? I mean, we're not, very, we're not very good at it in my house, no. but uh, yeah. yeah. Funnily enough, um, talking social media, it was one of those things I nearly missed out on through not having it because they were trying to get hold of me and couldn't find a way, but eventually did. Um, four or five years ago, five or six maybe now, I don't know how long I've been doing it, but um, my... Very good friend John Champion was my predecessor uh, in that job. And uh, as they had 
when John took it over, it was time to freshen up and have a new voice. Uh, I think my turn might come for that relatively soon. I don't know. But um, so uh, they got hold of me and said, do you want to do it? And I said, um, I have to tell you, I I'm not someone who understands this game. And they said, you don't have to be. But um, I, I think then they had a license with the Champions League. Yes. And my voice was was allied, if anything, with the Champions League. Um, and so that was great. And so I, I've been doing it ever since. Do your kids play? They play the other one. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's your exclusive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the truth. You can put that in there. I just, I, well, where I was going with that, I wasn't fishing for an exclusive. I was just, I was going to say, is it not weird to, you know, to walk past the living room and hear yourself? On no, I evening? mean, I have, I have, I have. It's been in. But I go, I go through the living room and I hear I'm Martin Tyler. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. he's on, yeah. he's on, yeah. he's on yeah. that one. Yeah. Yeah. That one's rubbish. I, I, <laughs> no, I, I, no, honestly, I, I, it's just it, nonsense, absolute yeah. nonsense. Okay, let's move away from that. Um, some general things, Peter, and then we're going to let you go. Well, I, I know you're a busy guy. Um, we, we had a question um, from Siddharth Balaji. Um, who asked, do, do you have a routine um, before you set up for a game? So from the moment actually on match day. Actually on match day. So you, yeah. you, you come into a stadium and um, with everyone else, you, you get your credentials and you move. Yeah. Is, there a, is there a routine you follow? Um, yeah, I suppose there is. Um, as you know, because we've been there together, you know, you often end up in the media room and... <laughs> Have a cup of coffee. Or, I saw more of you than I did my mother at Christmas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just, yeah. So I like to, but I, actually that is part of it for me. So I like to make sure that I'm broadly ready um, before I get there. I don't like to leave the house until I've got everything done that I possibly could have because I like to be there two and a half hours beforehand and allow myself that hour, which is very often just social, actually, with the other journalists and that's when you talk round things. And no just, panic. Everyone's no, calm. Everybody's you know, calm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it's a really important hour. And I do see other commentators. And again, I'm not knocking them because it's their routine. But quite often you see, see them there with the pens doing the last minute stuff. And I, I don't say I've never had to do that because I sometimes have. But I try not to because that hour of football conversation, it's like you say, talking to Martin Tyler, you know. Uh, and then um, when that's all done, um, I tend to go down to the pitch side or the tunnel and um, when the teams are announced and be there and sort of, because we have to be in touch with our producers to make sure the graphic is showing the right formation and all of that sort of thing. Um, uh, and then I wander up to the uh, gantry. I like to be at the gantry as early as I possibly can. Um, A, to finish my scribblings for the opening and the graphics and so on. Uh, and B, especially if there's a team that I'm less familiar with, because the players warming up, for me, it's not for everyone, but for me, is a really important time. And uh, so I get my binoculars out. And if there are two centre-halves who look similar to each other, I can see that one of them's got orange boots and one of them's got blue boots. I can see who's got short sleeves and long sleeves. I can see who's, um, you know, got like a stupid white, new haircut. Yeah, maybe, silly. You know. exactly. All <laughs> yeah, of that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and all of the points of distinction, which are really, really important, especially if you're in a stadium, uh, a really big stadium, we're a long, long way away. Uh, even the most famous players in the world, if you're 100 yards away and it's happening in the moment, if you catch Messi's orange boot as opposed to some other small fella's yellow boot, that can make a huge difference to the, to the moment. So... I spend 15, 20 minutes with my binoculars just going through and I don't sat it and they of course run up and down. And the worst thing they can do is warm up without numbers on their shorts, because then you're thinking, you know, the two that look similar, you're not sure which is which even then. But I, I, I like to satisfy myself before they've gone back in to come out again, that I can go down the line of them warming up and I say them out loud to myself, each of the starting 11. Well, when you're in the, oh, when, when so I'm on the gantry, when you're on the gantry. On air. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we've got a question from uh, AE Gaming. Um, uh, it's a little bit ambiguous, this one. He, he asks, uh, what is, what is your, your favourite commentary moment of all time? Interpret that as you want. Is, I, I, know, I know the person you are, so it's not going to be one of your own. I know that. But do you have a... Do you want mine or do you want someone else's? Well, I, I have my own take on yours, by the way, which well, I'll tell you in a minute. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, um, 
it's interesting how um, football and football commentary has changed down the years because I think probably the the classic football commentary lines of my early life were the simplest David Coleman lines. One nil. You know, yeah, exactly. Porterfield. Yeah, one nil. Yeah. You know, yeah. those are the ones which, when I'm in the playground pretending to compensate now, <laughs> I would pretend to be David Coleman doing that. And yet some of the great lines, again, a little further on me growing up, are lines which uh, would have been thought about and prevent, you know, um, Motti's 39 steps up to the pick up the, you know, Martin Bucken at Wembley and all that. I mean, that, that's a genius. And, and the, you know, the crazy gang have beaten the culture club and all of that. Yeah. Those, those, those are brilliant lines. Barry Davis in the hockey, where was the German defence? That, that will not have been thought about, but I mean... Because Barry Davis shouldn't be doing hockey in the first place, really. Like, uh, <laughs> no, he exactly, did, yeah. <laughs> but he did the hockey brilliantly yeah, in yeah. whatever it was, 84. Uh, Barry Davis. Yeah, Barry yeah, Davis, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, where was the German defence? Those are, those are all great lines. The, the greatest piece of sports broadcasting I've ever heard, uh, and I don't think it will ever be beaten, was um, Peter Jones on Sports Report on the day of the Hillsborough disaster, ah, yeah, which, yeah. which is a piece of uh, English with which, when I listen back to it now, I would recommend anybody to look it up and listen to it and find fault in it in terms of its taste, its journalism, its tone of voice, uh, and its just f- whole encompassing of a horrendous day. It's, it is... It is absolutely the highest bar broadcasting in sport has ever known, I think. I, I obviously didn't hear that as live, of course, but I, I've heard it in the years since. Um, and I think it's amazing, given, given what we now know about that day and what was known at the time. Sorry. It's yeah. really quite remarkable. And then, then, you know, easy for me to say, I was nowhere near, and easy for you to say, yeah. then I don't think anybody could have taken offence at it. And now... I don't think anybody that's, could take that's offense. That's the thing. It's, that's a yeah. hell of a thing to say. That. Yeah. yeah, and and extraordinarily, um, the great line, and I'll misquote it here, but it's along these lines. Um, at the end, his last line, and it does it puts puts a shiver up my spine. His last line is, "And the sun still shines," and it's a it just and it just hangs there. Uh, it's it's beyond brilliant. Do you? We're gonna we'll lighten up. I, I I'm, and we're gonna end here. Um. Do you remember your, your commentary for uh, uh, Dimitar Berbatov's penalty in the 2008 League Cup final? That's my favourite Drury moment ever. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. No. And Berbatov scores with such impotent ease. I'm a Tottenham fan. It, oh, it's, really? Yeah, yeah. It's just, uh, it's, oh, well, there you are. There you, go, there you yeah. are. That's very nice. Thank and, you. Uh, and the, the moments when, um, when Woodgate scored, when Woodgate scores an extra time, and he's kind of dancing down the touchline and the compassion in, in, the, in the commentary. If anyone hasn't heard that, go, go, and, go and look that up. Go and listen to Peter's commentary. Oh, thank it's, you. Uh, it's I've lovely. long since forgotten that. Peter, I've... thank you so much for coming in. It's, it's been great fun and we, we've, we've, we've kept you far too long as it is. Real pleasure, Seb. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks very much.